So in this last session for the day, we're kind of talking about US, EU, cooperation, policy, kind of big picture, um, uh, big picture, big picture things. And so I want to start uh, with Eric Washburn, who's the president of Windward um, Strategies, and he previously advised the US Senate Majority Leader and has worked for several um, presidential uh, campaigns. And I, I just want to kind of start by, let's talk about the US energy situation for a second. Um, in the last five to seven years, the US energy system's changed uh, quite a bit. The rise of shale gas, the Paris Agreement, um, the decrease in renewable energy costs, uh, and a shift from federal energy policy to more of a state-led energy policy effort. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that and a little bit about how you see the US-EU uh, energy policy relationship? Sure, Greg, thanks. Um, yeah, in the US, we are, we are going through what I would describe as, as an energy transition, although we're not really being led by a, a, a co coherent federal policy. We don't really have a coherent federal energy policy in the US. So it's really been driven uh, by a series of factors, primarily the states, uh, New England and California, and now, now Colorado and other states are, are proposing their own and implementing their own policies, driving a lot of um, renewable energy development. Of course, renewable energy costs are coming down. At the same time, over the last, say, 10 years, uh, ever since we had our sort of our failed uh, debate in Congress over a national cap and trade policy for carbon, um, but electric utility CEOs and boards, uh, despite not having a, a comprehensive carbon policy in the U.S., uh, have kind of seen the writing on the wall. And so as they're making investment decisions now in new generation capacity, uh, and these are investments that they expect to, to last and generate power for 50, 60, 70 years, they're doing it with the expectation that there's going to be a carbon price at some point in the next 10 or 20 years. And so you're seeing, we've seen new interest in nuclear, uh, which hasn't really worked out, but, but I think at some point we may see more nuclear interest because they want to put generation capacity in the ground that is carbon free. We're seeing a lot more interest in renewables. Um, natural gas, actually with the shale gas revolution, I think is going to be in the mix for the long term, particularly balancing out the renewables uh, to help the grid reliability. Uh, so it's, it's happening, uh, but without really a federal mandate. The other factor that's been interesting has been watching shareholder resolutions uh, and the so-called ESG investor movement. Um, and ESG stands for Environment, Social, and Governance. And what, what we've seen develop in the United States, and I think this is true in Europe, is that more and more companies are being rated every year by so-called ESG firms. And those rating reports go to investors, and you're seeing more and more funds invested in these sort of ESG funds. And so corporations that are doing more and more progressive things with energy are being rewarded by, by having access to cheaper capital. Um, so all of this is driving behavioral change in the energy system in the US, even absent a federal mandate. Um, in terms of cooperation with the EU, uh, it's, <laughs> it's been a little bit difficult because we've had tensions, high level tensions, the US decision to pull out of Paris, for example, the, the debate over NATO funding and things like that. So at the very highest levels, there's been this sort of tension, I guess, that's existed. Um, at the same time, there's, there is still a dialogue going on you know, I've, I've been in Brussels three or four times a year, met with Mr. Sefcovich a few times. Um, they're very interested in cooperating with the U.S. I know there's a, the cities in the U.S. that are very interested in doing progressive things on climate change are talking to Mr. Sefcovich, who's also working with cities in the EU. So at kind of a lower level, there is a level of cooperation, even though this tension exists at the higher levels. Excellent. Um, Daniela Lulace. Lulake um, is the director or the head of policy for the OECD Nuclear uh, Energy Agency. Um, can you talk for a little bit about markets and electricity markets and how uh, between US and EU um, we can uh, better define and better coordinate electricity markets and pricing? And then also, what's the future of nuclear energy? I mean, with places like Germany and California closing down nuclear, uh, but Russia and China building new nuclear around the world, where does that leave um, the rest of the, the rest of the world? Um, hi everybody. So 
you know, so I'm working currently for the Nuclear Energy Agency. That's part of the OECD, which is a community or what we consider to be like-minded countries. And I can tell you that, yes, probably there are some high-level polemics, but international cooperation continues. You know, OECD is, for example, one of, the, of these places. And I would start saying that despite some animosity which may arise from time to time, um, the reality is that European market as well as the North American market are challenged by the very same aspects. We do have, and they are global. Probably it is, you know, one of the prices of the history, at least Europe is, pay, is paying because, for example, in, ter in terms of generation, we have very old generation fleets which needs to be renewed. Uh, but we also have what it is, the Paris uh, Agreement, which says that we shall aim to decarbonizing our world. And all the studies which have been released on, on this topic show clearly that, in fact, the time frame we have to act is there. We can't afford to, to delay any such, such processes. And being part of the Paris Agreement or not, or not, for sure, we are breathing the same air, we, we are living on the same planet, we would like to, to eat, if possible, healthy food. So it is something we have to deal with. Another common challenge of the two markets, it is the market failure. Again, due to the new developments, the, uh, the raise, let's say, of the renewables together with the decarbonization, the shell gas, the oil press, uh, price, and so on, we clearly notice what it is commonly understood as being the market failure, which means that electricity prices on current markets cannot afford further investments. And if we don't have further investments in power generation and, and, and power grids, obviously we'll have blackouts, we'll have some sustainability and supply chain and affordability and access uh, problems re related to, to electricity. And in the modern days, we just became used to push the button and to have the light, either for our light, for the fridge, or for our, uh, for our business. And we have new technologies, which again have an impact on all, both markets. And I won't develop on all the, this theory of the Internet of Things, of the smart grids, of the smart, uh, of new technologies and so on. All I'm trying to point out is that we do face common challenges, the world is changing, and we will have to deal with them together. And that's how I'll go to the need of new market design, because if we don't, again, if we don't have investment, we don't have electricity, if we don't have electricity, we have huge problems as a result, and current markets being it here, and Eric, you, you may add, maybe can't allow investments because business people are going, are driven by profit and by the economics of an investment, not by the politics, not by the environmental issues, and it's fair to be like that because it's not their purpose, it's not their goal. And my very honest belief is that within this big, big picture, nuclear, it is a must. I can tell you that the, at the NEA, we've been really studying seriously this issue, and you, you may know or not, but Nuclear Energy Agency, it is an intergovernmental agency which uh, has 33 member countries, and the entire work it is developed with experts from the countries which are represented in the agency. So what the work we are releasing, in fact, it is endorsed by all the governments of the member countries. And our studies, as well as IEA studies, for example, clearly show that we can't imagine a future without nuclear, at least not in the hundred in the coming 50 to 100 years, until we'll maybe have some new, more 
disruptive technologies, but based on the technologies we know for the time being and still having uh, as a main goal decarbonization, nuclear will have to, uh, to, to play a role at this at the same level it plays for the time being, if not, uh, if not bigger. Of course, together with renewables, together with maybe um, capture gas and, and all others. But in order to have that, clearly, we, I'm going back to the idea, we need to look back at the market. You know, and for example, just one little example, uh, and, and uh, uh, I'll pass over to, to, the, to the next uh, speaker. One of the works we are uh, showing, in fact, now proves that on the, under current market design, we all experience in our markets. In fact, we are considering just the plant cost together with some cost of the system. In most of the countries, not full cost of the system. You don't have the full cost of the grid, you don't have the reserve capacity, you don't have the, the need for balance and, and all those. And we don't count at all for any social cost, for any environmental cost, for any land use uh, cost and so on. All this will have to, to be dealt with sooner or later, I would say rather sooner than, than later. Thank you. Um, and then what are the policies that you think that the US and the EU should work on together? What are the big picture things? I mean, earlier you mentioned R&D, um, you mentioned kind of the connection between Houston and the city we're sitting in right now. Where, where do you think that should head and what should the policymakers and the, um, you know, the government leaders be thinking about? You know, um, in every policy assessment, you have basically two big components. One is risk and the other one is opportunity. And I think on the transatlantic front, we have both. And probably this is the most complicated uh, moment of the transatlantic uh, cooperation in the last many decades. I would say when it started at the end of the Second World War. Also because the perception of risk and opportunity start to be divergent in America and in Europe, if we can speak of Europe or European Union as a homogeneous conglomerate, we are not. But by and large, we see this American administration, like the previous one, this might be surprising that I'm putting President Obama style with President Trump style, totally opposite, in the same, in the same package. It's the same package, which is basically managing relative decline of the West and of America in a world which is changing. President Obama tried to extract America from the imperial overstretch, too many wars, Afghanistan, Iraq, and try to basically consolidate the base. And like the, we are here in the, we are a former province of the Roman Empire. Also the Roman Empire, at a certain moment, after getting to its climax, they started to basically have a conscious retreat on strategic lines to defend better for the future, their supremacy and their preeminence. Um, President Trump is doing the same thing with other methods. He's trying to use and sometimes abuse of the levers of power that the American global dominance still does possess. That's why he says, I want more protectionists, because he's afraid of the deindustrialization of America and losing manufacturing jobs. He's trying to use the total uh, uh, lack of European defense posture. This is not about 2% for NATO for spending. This is about the fact that Europe is a pygmy in defense terms. And with UK leaving, we'll be left with basically just one real big army, which is the French one, and a few smaller ones. So what I'm just trying to say that there is a moment of, of, of big, big uh, uh, evolution or even revolution to the next world order. 
But still, Europe and America, we do have things in common. Uh, we are sharing not only uh, still common values, but we also share one of the most interesting and dynamic markets in the world. And if I start to understand, if anybody can understand the way in which President Trump operates, look at the other trade deals that he's been approaching. He has already a style and a method. Sometimes erratic, but it's still a method. NAFTA and also the Trans-Pacific uh, Trade Agreement. Basically, he says they're good for nothing. And he basically blows them up. A Twitter a message, one secretary of I don't know what, the administration saying they are good for nothing. We want our jobs back. America has been abused and robbed by the others. That's the usual rhetoric before doing this. But the moment he does that, he's basically opening a new negotiation. A new negotiation. Like was the case with NAFTA. The poor Canadians were running from one place to the other. The Mexican were saying what he's doing, the wall, I don't know what. But in the end, he re-engages in such a way that he can claim victory, even if there's not such a dramatic change from the previous agreement. This is something that I think President Trump and his administration will be doing also with the TTIP, with the Transatlantic Investment Partnership. Even if it will not be at the scale and ambition that we used to have before, I think he was sabotaging this thing also in order to get a better deal. He invited the European automakers to Washington just a few days ago. There is a conversation between the European Commission, which is the, on trade, in European Union, and Americans forget this, that one of the few common policies in European Union is trade. The Commission negotiates on behalf of all of us, including Bucharest, including Berlin, including Paris, including everyone else in the EU of 28, 27. So, do we have on energy, because this is the point, uh, if you narrow down the conversation to this, we have both, risk and opportunity. There is a risk in Europe of an over-dependence of Russia. And this is something that also makes a few important European Union countries relatively weak strategically on this. And the criticism of America on Nord Stream 2, this northern transport corridor, which was shared by Romania and Poland and the Baltic countries, is something which is a divergence. In the same time, we cannot rely only on the Russian gas and energy. We need to diversify. If you look at the European Union numbers, we are basically in a very fragile and, and, and weak position globally in terms of energy. So we need American LNG, LPG, whatever, and of course, Romania is unlucky with our geography this time that we cannot have this kind of terminals because of the nature of the Black Sea. But in Lithuania, in Poland, in Croatia, in Spain, probably in other Southern European Union countries for the Israeli or the uh, Cyprus or whatever, Egyptian gas, I think Europe will need America on this thing. One other dimension which I think is interesting and important is not only about Russia. It's mainly about China. And I think for good reasons, for good reasons, President Obama and his administration tried to pivot to Asia, which was not an embracement of China. It was basically trying to coalesce a big coalition of democracies in the Indo-Pacific area, India, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, who are Western liberal democracies, even if their geography is, is, is on the other side of the, of the planet, and try to cope with the rise of China, which is a big thing, and it's a game changer, much more than the resurgence of Russia, to be honest. So, when it comes to Europe, even if now is this more acrimonious conversation between Washington and Brussels and, and America and Europe, I still believe that there is no other way for America alone to be able to continue to be the number one player in the world without regrouping with Europe. And there is one place where we should regroup easier than in other things, it's energy. 
And I think the uh, a smaller, more modest version of the transatlantic uh, free trade agreement before will start with energy. Of course, there are some countries in Europe, like Germany, that will be very resistant on nuclear. Uh, you see the uh, huge success of the Green Party in Germany. We look in Germany only to the extreme right, the alternative for Germany, which if they will have snap elections in Germany, which I think they will, I don't think Chancellor Merkel, if her rival will be elected at the head of the party, will continue as chancellor. I don't think that SPD, the junior partner, will continue without Merkel in government. So this means that we'll probably have elections in Germany sometime next year. I hope not during our presidency, because we have too many on our plate already. But, but if you look to the Green Party in Germany, which is probably the equivalent uh, of the extreme right parties in Germany. The estimates, and there's a good piece in the New York Times th this morning, if you want to look at this thing, is that the Greens in Germany will be probably the second party in this big country, replacing, unfortunately, from my standpoint, the Social Democrats. What is the composition of the Green Party? It's not the Trotskyist, anarchist, uh, 1970s, cocktail Molotovs in the streets of Germany, party that funded by Russians that we used to know. It's a centrist party that reinvents basically a narrative of modern politics in a big European country. So I think we should engage the new forces in Europe, not only the traditional forces in order to, to do that. So in a nutshell, for Romania, because we are here also in Ploiesti, I think that if we'll do what a country like ours should do, continue to engage into the construction of the next generation of the European Union project, which is an amazingly important project to all of us. And if we'll be able to keep our ties with America and influence as much as we can, the European policies to keep our fundamental alliance with America and North America, because also our Canadian friends are also important, I think Romania will be safe. If America and Europe diverge, Romania will be in a very delicate position. Number one, because we'll have to choose. I was talking to Maggie over, over lunch and to, to the other said, how can I choose between my father and my mother? That's Europe and America to us. How can I choose between one of them? I need them both. I need a family. And if there is, again, I come back to this, a point where we can restart building trust and common interest and common assessment of risk from Russia, from China, from the Middle East. Europe and America should continue to work together. And energy probably will be the first building block of renewed trust between the two sides of the Atlantic. For this small part of Europe, which is Romania, this smaller part of Romania, which is Ploiesti and the Prahova County, we don't want the divorce of our parents. Divorce is bad, and divorce creates unhappy children. We want to be joyful children, not unhappy children. And just to follow up on that, uh, you talked about President Trump's kind of negotiating style. Do you think that the Paris Agreement withdrawal is also in the same vein where he's trying to set up a better bargaining position? And if so, what should the EU or the Romanian response be to that? I'm afraid it is not the case. I think he's in a denial mode. And I was, as an observer, I'm not in politics anymore, I'm a free, free citizen now, I, I can speak up my mind. When a governmental American agency, US agency, basically presents the huge negative impact of climate change on all of us, on our planet, on each of us, including America, look at the wildfires in, in California, look at what's happening all, all around the world. I think there is something more than a negotiation uh, tactic here. I think it's something more profound in terms of beliefs. And because I forgot to mention one big disruptor between Europe and America is Iran. And again, you know, also France is very close to Romania. We are very close to the French, historically. They've been a great ally of ours in the last 150 years. And the way in which, uh, let's say, President Macron was trying to convince President Trump when he paid the state visit to, to Washington with all the accolades and all the big hugs, 
and then you return and the next day you find out that uh, Iran is... I can understand why the, the Iran deal should be revisited. I fully understand that and I think Romania also understands that. But the divergence between Europe and America around sanctions on European allies because of Iran uh, is there. I think the conversation about creating a European SWIFT, you know, the SWIFT from banks, which is now controlled by America, and have a European SWIFT is a huge danger for divergence in the financial markets. And I think the sooner we find some way to... So in, in, a, in a very unfortunate way, what, what happened in Saudi Arabia with the killing of the Washington Post journalist and the huge uproar of this, in a, in a cynical way or in a sort of a counterintuitive way might help to rebalance a little bit the, 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 the way in which Europe and America see the greater Middle East and the big confrontation between the Sunni and the Shia and a new balance in this, in this critical part of the world. So let's turn to research and development for a minute. Eric, the, there were two announcements over the past few months um, in the US on new technologies. One was a, a test uh, natural gas power plant in Houston that collects almost 100% of the carbon that's emitted um, and they're just getting started building or they're gonna get started building a, a full-size 300 megawatt plant in the next few years. Um, and then the second was this announcement by General Motors two days ago that they're, the, the, the press largely covered that they're closing down five plants, laying off thousands of workers, but the other half of that announcement is that they're rededicating those resources to autonomous and electric vehicles. Um, what, what's the, what, what does research and development look like? How, do the, how are the states, how are states like Colorado and California gonna be playing into um, bringing up and, and deploying technologies like these natural gas plants, like these um, autonomous vehicles? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we, on, on CCS, on carbon capture and sequestration, I think that there are real opportunities between the US and the Euro Europeans to, to collaborate. Um, our Congress just passed uh, a few months ago a new tax incentive, a $50 a ton tax incentive for CCS. Um, I know the European Commission um, is planning to dedicate a portion of the European trading system revenues for CCS uh, to create a fund. So there's, there's a very strong common interest in, in both continents to do this. Uh, at the same time, neither continent has yet figured out how to really do this economically. There was an expectation 10 years ago when the U.S. debated its cap and trade policy that if that got enacted, it would create over time a sufficient carbon price and a sufficient incentive to get this done. But we haven't done that yet. But I think, you know, the U.S., despite the fact that we've closed probably 300 or 400 coal-fired power plants over the last 10 years, um, the future of natural gas in the U.S. is still quite bright. And I think if, if natural gas wants to have a strong future beyond, say, 2050 or 2060, it's really going to depend upon uh, the commercialization of CCS, and I think the same is probably true in Europe. Um, so even though the U.S. has talked about pulling out of Paris, uh, most utility executives expect us to be in some sort of a climate regime going forward, and I think this, is, this could be uh, one of the areas where we cooperate together for some, some, some common interest. I don't exactly know how that cooperation is going to take place. The Department of Energy in the U.S. is interested in making CCS um, viable. I know the Norwegians have done quite a bit of work with, with CCS. Um, again, I was in Brussels a year ago talking to the Sefcovich people and they're interested in it. So I think we, one of the things that would be useful, and I don't know if it's gonna happen, but is to, is to figure out some sort of a consortium of industry and academia in the EU and in the US who work together using these, these incentives that are, that are now being put on the table to try and make this happen. I think that can happen. I think it needs a little bit of leadership push from both sides, but. Um, so, and Daniela, how, uh, you, you were the CEO of a utility, and now you are spending a lot of your time studying markets and how, how markets work. When these new technologies, uh, you know, kind of come out and are ready to be deployed, how do you think about that? How do companies think about what technologies to adopt, how to pay for them, which ones are too risky, which ones are, you know, ha what's, your, what's your thoughts on that? As a CEO, my answer will be very straightforward. Risk return, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's clear. Uh, and that's what I, I've mentioned previously, you know. There are different layers and we do have different roles on, on, on this, uh, this world. 
uh, and, and CEO and business person will always take the decision based on such goals because that's their, their role, their purpose. It is the policymaker's role to really create the grounds, to create the landscape where certain policies uh, really support the development of new technologies, of CCS, for example, of, or in, in new uh, nuclear reactors, as it was really supporting and is still uh, supporting the renewables. The renewables have became cheaper because a lot of investment was done in uh, the research and development of these technologies. And yes, now they are mature and they can really easily, easily become a real player on the market. Now we are just at the next level where we really have to create a level playing field where, yes, afterwards business environment will decide based on business criteria. But before that, we really need to create the, the, new, the new landscape. Otherwise, businesses will continue to take their decision based on their triggers, based on their incentives at this won't necessarily be social, environmental uh, driven. I, I would, I would uh, build upon what Eric was saying at the beginning of our conversation. And of course, private business is basically profit driven. But there is an immense pressure coming from our public opinions from our public opinions everywhere around the world, including in less developed countries, and countries that are still struggling with survival and development and poverty and famine. And of course, like in the Maslow pyramid, they have not reached the citizen to the level of preoccupation. But still, I see an immense pressure on the business models, not only of utilities, but also on technology companies, on the big financial and banking industry. And we see attempts to find a solution to the crisis of capitalism, because that's what we are going through. It's a crisis of capitalism. If there is, nobody says an investment should not be profitable, God forbid, it doesn't make sense to do it. But to think of the other consequences of your action or inaction, this is something which becomes important. And some of the business leaders around the world who understand, and they're leaders with big brains, big hearts, and big pockets. And that's a good combination to be a big, a big brain, a big heart, and a big pocket, or a checkbook, because you can move things. So at Aspen Romania, we are working in our, one of our leadership programs from the public sector with the concept that Professor Sporter and Kramer from Harvard developed a few years ago in the Harvard Business Review a few years ago on shared value capitalism. And there are already banks and companies that do not only the bottom line, the profit, but also environmental impact, the cost on the, on, on the communities. And you start seeing already financial industry punishing companies that don't realize that you have to do something. You are a responsible citizen, or you should be, of this planet and, this, and, and that community. So I, I, I think that the citizenry is becoming a more important actor than ever before. And this is probably one of the arguments why we should fight for our liberal democracies. Because if you, some people might be tempted for expediency because it's easier, you see results faster, to go back to authoritarian regimes. We had this thing in Romania until recently, only 30 years ago. I have to say that this is something that makes progress faster, but the cost on the society is just immense. So here I think a new compact, a new compact among the Western or liberal democracies, and here again I add Australia, New Zealand, they are tremendous innovators in business, in community work, Ideas are not coming only from Europe and America. Our Canadian friends in governance, they do tremendously wonderful things. So if we want to do something, again starting from eventually from energy, I think we should think of a compact that will be both profitable, doesn't make sense, but also to start being a little bit closer to the needs of our society. 
And the last point is that the business models that we see today, I think before not too long, most of the current business models in the energy world as corporations will suffer a massive transformation. Massive transformation. And this is something that, again, we do not know how the future will look like. But uh, in the end, um, demand is driven also by public sentiment. And responsible, not only CSR, corporate res social responsibility. OK, that's fine. Lots of people do it. But I'm speaking of changing the model, changing the nature, responsible nature of capitalism. This is something that we like it or not, progressive or uh, conservative. This is not about ideologies here. If we want to survive as the dominant intellectual, technological, and military force of the world as the West, we have to innovate. We have to continue to make progress. If not, others will come from behind. And unfortunately, the other model, which is the authoritarian, uh, top-down, no voice for the citizen uh, model, would eventually prevail. Who tells us that they will not show to the world, the Chinese and the others, uh, other Asian uh, countries like Korea or even Japan, that their system of societal organization is more efficient than ours. And this would be really the end of our dominance at the global level. Now I'm going to pose a question to each of the panelists, the same question. Um, in, in a previous um, job that I had, I worked at the White House and I was in charge of selecting kind of the senior policy officials for President Obama's um, administration. And one of the questions I'd ask all of my candidates is if you had three minutes in the Oval Office with the president, what would you advise him to do? Um, so I'm gonna pose the question to the three of you. If you were the third person in the room between the European Commission and the US negotiators on a, an energy deal between um, uh, the two of us, what would be the thing that you would put at the top of your list as, as what you would want to accomplish, what you would want as part of that deal? <laughs> uh, good question. Uh, you know, I, I, I ideally it would be probably the U.S. return to Paris. I mean, I think that that creates an overarching framework of, co of cooperation and, and a share, sh set of, sh of shared goals. Um, if that were not, you know, under the current administration, that's really not on the table. So the question is, can you do something that's sort of sub-Paris, I guess, that, that leads to that sort of level of cooperation? Um, it would be great to see, you know, a sort of a, a U.S.-EU uh, energy pact framework where we could where we could put money into CCS. We could put money into battery production and research. You know, Asia has got the dominant share of the battery market right now. The Europeans are very concerned about that. Mr. Sutkovich has got this EU battery alliance going. Um, the U.S. could benefit from that. Uh, the U.S. and the Europeans could benefit from more free trade in, in, in natural gas, uh, as, as the Nord Stream 2 uh, issue has, has, has shown. It's in our interest to see Europe being energy independent. Um, but can we, can we put aside some of these ideological battles over climate change and, and, and focus on some of the pieces that get us to that goal in, in a way that is politically acceptable to both sides? Um, but I think creating some sort of a, a cooperative agreement along those lines would, I think, be a very positive step forward. Hmm. Yeah. First of all, I echo Eric. I, th I think it is, you know, we need to have some common goals. I think it is what Mircha said earlier. In order to advance, you have to have a set of one, two, three common uh, goals, common grounds, common platforms. And Paris Agreement, for sure, it is one of them. And cooperation, again, one of the challenges we both face is that a lot of research, development, innovation, it moves to other places of, of, of the globe. Of course, we can become from leaders followers, or if we still want to keep our leadership we need to cooperate. So I would praise for cooperation. First of all, I would uh, urge every government in the EU, starting with the Romanian government, to hire someone like you, Greg. 
someone to be able to recruit people uh, in top positions that can really understand what the hell is going on. Because the risk uh, in moments like this of big transformation is for us as human beings to go back to our already existing convictions and experiences. We know best, we've done this, we've done that, I've been that, I've been governor, I've been, I don't know. So I think the first thing is for us to find a small group of leaders in Europe and in America that can really understand what's going on, let's say in the energy sector. And if we'll have, and I think it's possible, people in the you know, Commerce Department, people in the USDR, people in the uh, other state and, and, and sub-national level, let me put it like this, corporations, academia, and we can create a small, how should I put it, elite team, in the modern sense of the term, an elite team of people that can really think together on the way forward. If the country in Europe that will be giving the next Sefcovic, the next European commissioner, or the next, the next, you know, one of the few guys that really has been pushing for the energy union, um, if we'll be able to really give uh, in the next European Parliament, not only people who are loyal to the party X or Y, but we have people that really have a knowledge and put in the energy committees in Congress, US Congress and European Parliament, a few group of professionals that can understand, I think we have a chance. Because politics also needs to innovate, also needs to refresh their things, not only from a younger generation, because youth is a relative notion, also from different horizons. People that have been working in business, people that have been working in research, people that also worked and lived in China or Japan and understand also the rise of Asia, which is something that sometimes in the West we don't comprehend that, that easily. But first of all, we should try to, to, to urge and to put pressure also from our public opinions and, and elections, through elections, not only to elect people out of our huge rage against traditional politics, which is something which is normal because politics don't deliver, but if we choose only with the rage will continue to elect, like in many countries, let's say Italy in Europe, exceptionally uh, dangerous solutions, because when you are upset, you attempt to take decisions, la nervi, cum spunem noi, when you're upset. I think if we have discontent to the state of affairs, and we should, I think we should also look towards political experimentation. And if it's not a change of political parties, at least of the people we want to see in those parties. And afterwards, that leader to have to be smart enough, like President Obama, to hire somebody with the level of Craig and says, I want you as a filter. I want you to bring me the best and the brightest people we can afford to have in our administration, in our government, in our European Parliament, in our next European Commission. And I think if we start with energy, because that's also a, 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 a field of, of the world economy and American European economy which is indispensable. Technology and energy are the only two things that we cannot, we cannot shy away, we can run away from this. These are two realities. And I think this will be probably, Europe has a couple of strong, strong points. Look at the regulations on technology that Europe is the leader today, and I think we need to regulate somehow without destroying innovation and technology uh, and venture and risk capital formation. Also America has its own strengths and continues to be a leader and a natural global leader in, in, other, in other directions. So a long answer to, to this thing is that when you're a moment, this is not energy transition, Eric. This is energy and world transformation. It's transformation. And this is one of the most profound and severe and impactful transformations in human mankind history. We never had at the same time in such a short compressed period of time so many game changers, so many structural mega trends affecting our societies and the world. America and Europe should stand together. Diverging when we have different interests, like in a family, 
I have an interest to go and spend my national day in Ploiești, not in Bucharest, fine. But when it comes to fundamental things, especially about the, world, the way in which the world is organized, the new economic and social compact, something that will deliver our citizens a better life and more decency, this is something that all of us have a stake. And even if Romania is a small player and we don't expect a fantastic presidency of EU Council just because it's also very short because of the European elections of next May or June, I think we have the obligation, let's say on energy, to push the agenda and I can assure that the Aspen Institute with our modest resources will try to be of help to our decision makers and European leaders when we'll meet uh, on April 1st, nu e păcăleală, this is not a, pe 1 aprilie se întâlnesc ministrii energiei din Europa la București, în timpul președinției noastre, during our presidency, we were asked to be of some help, and I think people like us, with our modest uh, combined uh, contributions, could give something like that. I'm hopeful that uh, Europe and, and in America, America and Europe, will continue to be leading, not in terms of hegemons of any sorts, but basically continuing to lead on the realm of ideas and values and leadership and transformative changes and not just incremental changes like most of us are tempted to do in our daily lives. So, fun times, fun times. I, I, hope, I'll, uh, I hope I'll be healthy enough to, to live through all these transformations. So I think we have uh, time for maybe a question or two, um, if anyone. I, I think you are very right talking about the uh, technology and energy and the, the young generation and how transformational the, the times are that, that we're living. Um, my question would be to all of us. Um, what we see is there's a lot of pressure coming to the CEOs of companies, to the government, from the people, from the younger generation, from inside the companies. People don't just want to work. They want to work for companies that are socially responsible, that are environmentally responsible. But then it comes to the decision making. And decision making is very often, and Romania is a good example, but it's not the only one, and, and I think it's all around Europe and the US. Decision making at the lower level is made by people that are my age or more and people that are not so technologically astute and don't have this desire to innovate. So how, how can we help these decision makers, these people that are willing to do something but maybe don't have the knowledge on the technology, are not up to speed, how do we help them to understand that they need to make decisions that are allowing the future to develop and the young generation to thrive? That's a, gr that's a great question, actually. Um, and I see that in, in my work as a consultant, as I work with large corporations um, in the energy space who are uh, struggling with the energy transition to sort of comprehend it and then to, to redirect their own internal R&D and marketing and so forth in a way that's going to be consistent with public expectations. And part of all that is recruiting young people, millennials, uh, and not just recruiting them in as, as, as a workforce, but also appealing to them as, as consumers. And I think there's a certain amount of Darwinism that is taking place here, and that is that corporations that do this well are going to appeal to millennials. They're going to be able to recruit millennials. Those millennials will help them figure out how to have that conversation with this next generation and, and meet their expectations. And those corporations that don't do that well are going to, are going to suffer and fail. Um, there's no magic answer to that. I just I think that the people in the C-suites now of corporations who are smart and progressive and, and are going to be successful understand that. Um, and I think that the people who don't understand that um, are going to see their corporations suffer. And, as, and when the corporations suffer, the C-suite will clean out because the, the ex executives who, who, who are not performing well on that, who are not reaching out to millennials, who are not steering their ship in a different direction in a way that appeals to that generation are going to lose out and shareholders are going to want a new set of leaders. Of, of leaders. Um, so I think it's going to be a, a sort of a Darwinian process. But. Yeah, yeah I, I would add that they don't need to be taught. 
you know, it's, if they are good, they are adaptable, they are flexible, and they are adapting to the new world as the new world is transforming. And if not, you know, competition at the end of the day will prevail. Uh, yes, the world is changing and the new generations have different expectations. In a way or another, they will manage to really, imp not impose, but make their system of beliefs very clear and present and will have an influence. And I think the entire transformation we keep talking about, it, it's going on because the new generations are driven by different goals, because we do have the disruptive technologies which are part of our new reality. So it is just a process going on that I would say, I would add the question, not how to to teach them how do we all adapt to take the best out of this change? Um, that's a great question indeed. We, we had yesterday in Bucharest a, um, an Aspen conversation on human uh, capital. And you listen to the previous panel here on Ploiesti and Prahova, everybody complaining about the scarcity uh, of human capital basically not only in, in numbers, but also in quality and qualifications. So, um, I differ a little bit from, uh, from Daniela here, because if we just let the ones from the younger ones, and also from the older ones, or young adults like us, um, um, just to adjust if they are smart enough or lucky enough to have the equipment to adjust to the new situation, we run the risk of leaving lots of other people behind. And the Trump, uh, the Brexit, uh, the Italian elections, the rise of extreme right in, in Germany, the rise of populism in Romania, these are also the result of the, uh, the revolt of the every citizen who seems to and fears not to be left out from this thing. So we need proactive policies. Romania is a country that still has 38% of our population living in the countryside. 51% of the children of Romania are still born in the countryside. More and more Romanian children are, are born outside of Romania because of the huge migration of young Romanians uh, all over the world, not only in Europe, all over the world. Um, so if we don't start very, very young, that's my answer. And if we don't start to have what we call continuous, uh, not only education, adaptation, here I agree with Daniela, continuous adaptation. If corporations will not start to reach out and make partnerships with local schools, with vocational schools, with technology things, and using digital, using that, if we don't have a, a policy of inclusiveness in the digital era, uh, I'm afraid that our societies will react with violence, I say violence, in the political sense of the term. Because there is one thing that people do not accept, is to see that themselves or the kids or the grandchildren are basically denied the chance to succeed in life. This is something that none of us would, would accept, I think. There's another thing that people do not accept. Uh, uh, and this is something that we have not discussed here, we'll have another uh, conversation at a different moment is also about the implications of genetics, of, uh, of uh, genetic engineering. Uh, look at the huge uproar uh, of yesterday, I think, when a, when a Chinese scientist operated modifications on human genes. This is an ethical and political issue and regulation issue that will be probably one of the most complex we ever had. I'm giving you this because we're entering a very, very complex time and my concern as a, as a people in public life for many years is even the smartest politicians, even the smartest governments, the more efficient governments, Romania is not in that category, unfortunately, but even the most performing ones in the world will have difficulties to cope with this kind of pressure. And that pressure will come from the sense of inequality on opportunities to succeed in the new economy and the new world. This is probably the fundamental tension of, uh, of human society. And I think if we are smart 
in Europe and in America, even Romania, smaller places like us or other countries in our region, I think we should try to, 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 to confront this upfront and not just let things come over us and then to see cine poate scapă, we basically have a sort of an individualistic survival uh, technology. But your question is fundamental, how can we have the human capital and, 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 and individuals, people, people, real people with real lives, with real dreams, with real problems, with real diseases, with real jobs, be successful in a new economy, and I'm afraid we don't have a solution at this point in time. And we have to improvise together and eventually come with an integrated solution from public, private, and non-governmental sectors together. Not public, private, and uh, civil society, public, private, and civil society, the holy triad is the only answer to this kind of problems of such magnitude. I'll just add two things. My colleague Maggie here is running a program for um, the Energy and Environment Program, which helps uh, get scientific research into the hands of regulators in a kind of more uh, more organized way, and that way regulators have the most up-to-date information. And that's one way of doing it, is kind of organizing the information that the policymakers or the regulators or the decision makers at companies um, uh, need to have to make decisions. I know uh, I don't have enough time in any day to read everything that's sent to me, and so it's completely information overload. The other thing is, um, to go back to the General Motors example, uh, I visited their autonomous uh, vehicle unit uh, a few months ago, and what General Motors did is that, you know, they're located in Detroit, that's where they build a lot of their things, and kind of around the, the upper Midwest of the U.S. They put their autonomous unit in kind of a cool neighborhood in San Francisco, kind of halfway between the city and, and uh, Silicon Valley, because they knew they'd be able to attract, um, you know, more educated, smarter, younger kind of engineers and scientists to that area than they would to Detroit or Michigan. Um, and so they did that very purposely in the run-up to this announcement this week that they're focused more on these self-driving cars, um, be, you know, and, and, uh, and allow them to kind of take a lead on this within the, the auto industry. Um, so I think with that, I want to thank our panelists. Uh, so everyone give a round of applause, please.